Well, there's a phrase that I often hear repeated uh, time and time and time and time again around Christmas time. It starts pretty early. Uh, it starts now uh, pretty much the day after Halloween. Uh, but it, it's, the phrase is this, it's not Christmas until. And then the person will fill in whatever is the signifying event or uh, practice that takes place. It's not Christmas until I hear Christmas music on the radio. It's not Christmas until I give a gift to someone, one of my favorites. It's not Christmas until I get a gift from someone. I'm just being honest. We're going to have an honest time together this evening. It's not Christmas until the walk through nativity. I hear that uh, a lot from people. It's not Christmas until the, the choir and the orchestra's hallelujah uh, program. It's just not Christmas until that particular event takes place. It's not Christmas until I taste Sonia Stalling's sweet potato casserole. It's just not Christmas until that has crossed uh, my lips. So there, there, there are many different things. People will say it's not Christmas uh, until we have those Christmas Eve uh, services. Well, I, one of mine is it's not Christmas until we watch our favorite Christmas movie. Now, in our family, I'm sure your family is in complete unison on this, and y'all have no debates and discussions, but no two people in our family agree on what the best Christmas movies are. So we end up having to watch some of the worst movies you can ever possibly imagine. We have a wide range of levels of everything in our family. And so we get a lot of animated suggestions, movies that are animated uh, that would be thrown into the hopper of the best possible Christmas. We have some very contemporary children. They literally live on the cutting edge. They're trendsetters in every way. And so you'll see movie here, movies like Elf and things like that, and these contemporary movies. And that, they, they throw in all their nominations until dad says, okay, here's the rule. They have to be accurate theologically. Wow. <laughs> there, you know, that, that's like a, you know, and of course, dad usually spoils all the fun with rules like that, although I do think that's a godly rule, but that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. And so I tend to win out because my two favorite movies are the most accurate theologically. So do, please don't, please don't suggest Miracle on 34th Street. Please don't suggest It's a Wonderful Life. That's the worst theology. There are no angels, wings, brings bells ringing, da, 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 da. Okay, so, so those get ruled out immediately. But the two movies that I think are the most accurate theologically and by far the best Christmas movies ever are one, The Bells of St. Mary. Now, if you've never seen The Bells of St. Mary, then you're young, okay? <laughs> So you, and you could be 50 right now and go, well, I'm young. Okay, I've never seen it. Well, you need to watch The Bells of St. Mary. Obviously it stars uh, Bing Crosby and Ingrid Bergman, and they just play a, a, a priest and a nun, and it's a very godly movie. And at the end, there's a big Christmas blessing uh, that takes place. But the most theologically accurate movie that I nominate and, and select as the best Christian movie of all time is clearly The Grinch That Stole Christmas. Now, if you've never understood The Grinch That Stole Christmas, you might not appreciate it fully, but The Grinch That Stole Christmas must have been written by a very smart theologian because it is a very theologically uh, correct movie. Now, the story basically unfolds like this. There is a Grinch and he lives up on Mount Crumpet and he can't stand happiness. He can't stand joy. So he hates anything that brings happiness and anything that brings joy. And so down in the valley below are the Who's. They live in Whoville. You're with me, okay, see? I'm getting a lot of votes for this movie uh, tonight. So the Who's live down in Whoville and obviously it stars the Grinch as himself and it stars little Cindy Lou Who as little Cindy Lou Who. And so the, the, they're the main characters of the movie and as it begins to unfold, the Grinch decides that he's gonna steal Christmas from all of the Who's in Whoville. So he dresses up like Santa Claus and he gets his little bitty puppy dog and he makes him look like a reindeer and that's a pretty fun thing that happens. And they go down into the town on Christmas Eve, it would be tonight. 
and they go into the town and the Grinch begins to steal all of the who trimmings and all of the who decorations and all of the who presents and even the who roast beast. And he takes all of the who stuff uh, from Whoville, puts it in his sleigh, takes his dog and they head all the way back up Mount Crumpet uh, to the very top. And he waits the next morning so that he can hear all of the crying that takes place down in Whoville because he has stolen their Christmas. Well, he wakes up and he begins to hear down in the, in the, the town down uh, there, Fahu Foray, Dahu Dore. Now you probably don't understand what that means in the Greek. I can explain it to you. Um, it means Jesus Christ is Lord is what it means, okay? And so they sing the Fahu Dore, Fahu La, and they, they sing and sing and sing and he can't believe it. He, he realizes that he has not stolen the who's Christmas, he's actually uh, just taken their stuff, that somehow he thought Christmas was all about the stuff and he missed it completely and they have all this joy down in Whoville and it says, and I quote, that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. Now that is interpreted to mean he became a Christian, okay? <laughs> So it's a, it's a wonderful Christmas movie and the, the, the bad guy, the Grinch, actually becomes a Christian at the end of the movie. It can't get any better than that. So please do not email me and tell me that you have a better movie than how the, uh, the Grinch stole Christmas. Well, we're not here tonight to talk about how the Grinch stole uh, Christmas, uh, but, or me to try to convince you that it is the best uh, movie, which it is, but I'm not gonna try to convince you of that. My question for you tonight is one that is related to that though is, do you have a Christ, uh, Christmas that can be stolen? Is it possible for your Christmas to be stolen? In other words, the Who's in Whoville had a Christmas that couldn't uh, possibly be stolen. But unfortunately, I'm here to tell you, and I probably don't have to tell you, that there are present day Grinches. You may have them in your family. You, they, they could be at your dinner table. Now don't look, don't, if you just look down the aisle at your uncle or your brother or something like that, don't, don't do that because you're gonna get yourself in trouble and that's gonna ruin someone's Christmas, okay? So we're not trying to identify the Grinches tonight. I'm just acknowledging that there still are some present day Grinches and even unintentionally and sometimes unknowingly, they can kind of rob you of your Christmas. They can steal uh, your Christmas, but it doesn't have to be a Grinch. Sometimes our Christmases can be stolen or Christmas can be robbed uh, simply by our expectations not being met. Maybe you didn't get the Christmas gift that you always wanted. Maybe I have wanted a motorcycle since I was 12 years old and every Christmas, maybe, I look under the tree to see if there's a box that big. I've looked this year, there'll be no motorcycle under my tree yet, but I'm okay with that. I'm getting to be okay with that. I'm making progress uh, in dealing uh, with that. Maybe you don't get what you want, or maybe the, you didn't, the person you gave a gift to or that you give a gift to, maybe they didn't appreciate it the way you thought they would. Maybe they didn't respond the way that they thought they would, and that robbed you of that uh, Christmas uh, joy. Maybe you're just not appreciated in all that you've done. You've done all this stuff for Christmas, and people just don't seem to appreciate it. When our expectations are not met, our Christmas can be stolen. When our circumstances sometimes can cause our Christmas to be stolen from us. Circumstances that are completely out of our control, Maybe you're not getting to be with those that you would want to be with this Christmas. Maybe you can't travel to them or they can't travel to you, or maybe the Lord has taken them from you and you can't be with them at Christmas. These are very valid circumstances and they create tremendous challenges and struggles for us uh, to be able to process. But even then, I believe there's a Christmas that cannot be stolen, that not even those valid, difficult, godly sovereign circumstances could steal uh, our Christmas. Well, how can you guarantee that you can have a Christmas that cannot be stolen? I can only think of two ways. One, you could move to Whoville. You could become a Who. Uh, the problem with that application is it's never been found. Uh, uh, we don't know where Whoville is and so that's not possible. But the second option, which comes from the Bible, is the better option. If you have a copy of God's Word, if you'll turn to Luke, 
chapter 10. There's a, a pew Bible there in front of you if you want to use that. Luke chapter 10. Now, those of you that are real studious on the Christmas story, you're going, Bruce, you mean Luke 2, not Luke 10. No, I mean Luke 10. I realize that the Christmas story is in Luke 1 and 2, Matthew 1 and 2, but we're going to go to Luke 10 because I believe it's a story that can guide us through uh, a view of Christmas. Look in Luke 10 and go down to verse 38. Luke 10, verse 38, Jesus is with his disciples and they are going from town to town, village to village. And it says in verse 38, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Well, this is a story that you may be able to relate to if you'll just stop and step back for a second. Have you ever had an unexpected guest? Has anyone ever dropped in? Has anybody ever all of a sudden come in unexpectedly? And you know, I've done the last second phone call to my wife and said, oh, by the way, uh, so-and-so is coming uh, to our house. Now I know what my wife would want to deliver and what would take place with all the scurrying to make sure that it's the best possible thing, but we've never had Jesus as the man come into our house. I can't even imagine that, that I call her and say, hey, by the way, Jesus is coming over for dinner. So you can understand when Martha realizes that Jesus is coming, he's been healing, he's been teaching, he's been preaching, he's the most talked about person in the entire community and people are unbelievably amazed at him. We find out later that Martha and Mary and their brother Lazarus have a very unique and close and personal relationship uh, with Jesus. And so they know who Jesus is. And so she wants it to be just right. She wants it to be perfect when uh, she comes into, when Jesus comes into her house. So she's not ignoring Jesus. As a matter of fact, everything she does is driven to serve him. So all the stuff that she does is driven so that she could actually, it would be about Jesus, or at least so that she thinks that all of her hard work is about Jesus. And so she gets busy doing all the, what she thinks is the necessary stuff in order to welcome Jesus into your home. And now he's there and she's working hard and she gets frustrated. What frustrates her is that Mary, her sister, is not helping. So Mary is just sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha is taking care of all the stuff that she thinks absolutely has to be done when Jesus comes to your house. But in Mary's frustration, she does an interesting thing in this story. Instead of rebuking and correcting Mary, she actually challenges Jesus. She doesn't turn to Mary and say, Mary, get busy. Now, maybe she had already done it, but it's not recorded and given to us. She doesn't turn to Mary. She actually turns uh, to Jesus and says to Jesus, do you not care? Jesus, do you not care? Can you not see that Mary is not helping me? Do you not see, do you not understand that Mary is not helping me uh, to serve you? Would you tell her uh, to help uh, me? And of course, Jesus doesn't reply uh, to Mary. That's what Martha wanted Jesus to do. Martha was trying to instruct Jesus to rebuke and to tell Mary and instruct Mary on what she ought to be doing. Instead, Jesus replies to Martha, 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 you are worried and upset. You are worried and troubled. You are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion and it will not be taken away from her. Now, why would I call that a Christmas um, uh, passage? Well, it reminds me of Christmas, to be honest with you. At Christmas time, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, Jesus coming into the world. In a sense, I think about Jesus coming to us, uh, Emmanuel, God with us, And I think that as I look at this story and and try to understand it, I could put most of us or I could put myself in somewhat of a flip floppy kind of way into one of two categories. I'm either embracing a Martha Christmas or I'm embracing a Merry Christmas. 
Either I am focused upon a Martha Christmas, which would be focused on all the details, or I'm experiencing a Merry Christmas, which would be focused upon Christ himself. Well, if we were to have a a Martha Christmas, let me say this, that's not a bad Christmas. It's not terrible. I mean, if a Martha Christmas was going to be a great experience that she has with uh, Jesus, Jesus in her uh, house, but uh, we realize, and Jesus points out to her, you're missing the point. You, you have Jesus, the Son of God, in your home. You are, you are seizing the opportunity, but you're missing the blessing. You can focus upon a celebration of Christmas that can absolutely acknowledge Jesus, that can absolutely acknowledge that he's the Son of God come born, uh, uh, born to this earth to do what God sent him to do. You can acknowledge that and yet actually miss Jesus himself. Can you imagine what would happen the day after uh, Jesus visits the house when Martha goes to the beauty parlor? And yes, I am convinced that she would have. Not that her hair needed to be done, but she needed to talk to everybody, right? Because Jesus came to your house. So you got to get out in the public square and you got to share this story with other people. And they ask her, we heard Jesus came to your house. What was it like? And she would say, it was awesome. I had the best leg of lamb. We, I made my favorite pomegranate salad. I don't even know if that exists or whatever it is, but my, my fig pie. And she would have said all this stuff. And I'm bet she would have acknowledged. Now you need to know Mary did not help me one bit. And so she would have probably shared that information. And then maybe somebody in the beauty parlor looks at her and says, what was he like? Who? Jesus. Well, I don't know what she would have said then. I don't know. I was too busy serving him. I was too busy taking care of all the stuff. I'm not sure what he actually said. I wasn't in the room. I wasn't listening for that particular part. Wow, so close and yet so far away. Right there in the midst of uh, an experience with Jesus and yet so far away. As a matter of fact, Mary lost his perspective to the point, as I mentioned a second ago, she makes a statement that at first, I just kind of cringe and go, Mary, you have lost it, sister. You looked at Jesus and said, do you not care? Think about that for a second. Can you imagine looking at Jesus in your house and saying, do you not care? Well, I'll be honest with you. I have said something similar to that before to Jesus. I've said something similar to that before to God. Do you not care about my present circumstances? Do you not care that this is working out in a way that's not good for me? Do you not care, Jesus, that this is not playing out, my life is not playing out the way that it's supposed to play out so that I can be honored and I can be uh, appreciated? Lord, uh, Jesus, do you not care that that, uh, my relationships have been broken? Do you not care that a loved one has been taken from me? Do you not care that I've lost my job? Do you not care that, that these issues are happening in my life? Do you not care? You fill in your blank. What is it that we might have said, do you not care? It's supposed to be a different way. Tell somebody, tell the president, tell the governor, tell the pe- my family members to fix it. Fix my life. Because that was Martha's perspective. Somehow, with Jesus in her house, it became about her. Somehow, the focus shifted and it became about her to the point that she actually would communicate to Jesus do you not care? Well, what about a Merry Christmas? How how would we contrast Martha's perspective and missing the point of Jesus being there to a Merry uh, Merry Christmas? Well, we're really only told one thing that Mary did. She sat at Jesus' feet and she listened to him. And I stop and I think about that and think, wow, we love to sing uh, to the Lord, oh, come, let us adore him. It's one of my favorite carols uh, that we sing. Let's gather together and let's adore Christ our Lord. And I have to ask myself a question, is it over when the song's over? When the, is it just a good line in a carol? Do I just like the line in the carol? Or is my Christmas defined by adoring Christ, worshiping Christ? Worshiping Christ would be what Mary did. See, it's not just that Mary listened to Jesus, it's that she humbled him, herself at his feet. Nothing else in the world mattered except sitting at the feet of Jesus and actually listening to what he said. A Merry Christmas is a Christmas that cannot be stolen. What did Jesus say? Jesus said that Mary had chosen the good 
portion. The good portion is Jesus. Mary chose Jesus over everything else. They might not even eat a meal, but she sat at the feet of Jesus and she listened to him and she humbled herself herself, uh, before him. A Merry Christmas will, will move us to love others with the hope of the gospel. Even the Grinches in our life that we get moved by focusing upon Jesus and understanding who he is and who he, uh, uh, how he has loved us. A Merry Christmas reminds us that God has exceeded all our expectations instead of focusing upon the others who haven't met our expectations. This morning, Phil Tuttle preached for us in the, our 10 o'clock service this morning, did a wonderful job. And one of the things that he communicated uh, to us was that his father-in-law uh, was called home to be with the Lord during the night uh, last night. And that his wife had shared a statement to him as they were talking through it. And just the timing uh, she felt was so difficult on uh, Phil because he was preaching uh, this morning. And she said that death had interrupted Christmas. And Phil made a profound statement. He actually acknowledged to himself it was a profound statement, which was odd. Uh, He and I talked about that later, but (laughs) Phil made a very profound statement in that sermon. He said, no, actually Christmas interrupted death. You see, that perspective doesn't just come to you from being busy doing things about uh, like Martha did. That perspective comes from sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him, believing him, submitting yourself to him, and submitting all your circumstances to him so that your default reasoning and your default perspective is to respond the way Jesus would respond. So I'm gonna give us just a handful of statements that Jesus made. What would it be like for us to take just a few moments tonight and sit at the feet of Jesus? Actually hear him speak about himself. If we were to have him here and we could just sit at his feet and ask just one question, Jesus, why? Why did you come to earth? Why did you leave heaven and come uh, to earth? Well, the day after Jesus did this miraculous feeding of the 5,000 that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with just five loaves and uh, two fishes, he goes to Capernaum, the crowd finds him there, and he declares to them, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So when Jesus was asked, why why would you come? Why why would you come down to earth? Why would you leave uh, heaven? He came down not to do his own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. He was completely submissive to the will of the Father. What an incredible model for us as believers. What an incredible model for us to, uh, to embrace and to understand that's our calling to completely submit ourselves, not to convince God of what he's supposed to do in our situation, but to completely yield ourselves uh, and submit ourselves uh, to his, uh, to, to, the, to the Father's will. Secondly, he comes to do the will of the Father, but then when he, there was a man, you may be familiar with this man, his name is Zacchaeus, and he went to great lengths to listen to Jesus. He went to great lengths to be able to sit at his feet and to listen and to learn from him. And Jesus said to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to your house, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So we can conclude that it's the will of the Father for Jesus the Son to come and to seek and to save the lost. You know, that's different than where I begin to, where my thoughts uh, start and begin. As I think and process, I think about lost people seeking Jesus because I have a bit of a man-centered perspective, but the reality is it's Jesus seeking the lost. It's, It's him that is seeking the lost people and that he came, he was sent by God the Father to go and to seek the lost, and not only to seek the lost, but to save uh, the lost. We're told in Matthew what Jesus's view of the lost is. Why would you call them lost? Why would you refer to people who uh, uh, who aren't believers? Why would you refer to them as the lost? Well, in Matthew, he says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They were lost. But you need to know if you're here this evening and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you're wanting to know what his view of you is, the world would tell you a lot of things, but let me tell you right from Jesus' mouth. 
Let me tell you, as if you were sitting at his feet and listening to him, he would look and he would first of all communicate the compassion that he has for you. And he doesn't see you as a mean and an evil adversary. He looks and he says, I look at you and I see you as harassed and helpless. The world has their embraces uh, upon you. And then he would refer to you as a sheep without a shepherd who desires to be your shepherd because he comes not only to seek the lost, to find them, to identify them, to love them, but also to shepherd them, to save them. How would he save them? Well, when the disciples were sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to his teaching, he instructed them and he says this, he says, even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. How would he save the lost? By literally giving of his life. He was born to die. The purpose in being born was to die, to willingly die, to do the will of the Father, to seek and to save the lost. And the lost cannot be saved unless there is a payment for their sins. Scripture tells us the wages of sin is death. In other words, what we have earned or what we deserve, wage of sin, anything we've done that violates God's law, what we've earned by doing anything wrong, and we've all done wrong things, what we've earned by that or what we deserve by that is death. And yet Jesus says that he came to give his life as a ransom, a payment to rescue, uh, a payment to free the captives, we're, we're captive in our sin, and Jesus gives up his perfect life as a ransom for that sin. He says also that he came uh, to uh, give eternal life. He says, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son, believes in him, should have eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then the last one is, he came to call sinners to repentance. He says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he came to call us to repentance, to turn away from our sins. So if you're here this evening and you don't know the Lord, then I would suggest to you that you need to sit at the feet of Jesus. And you need to listen not to what the world says, but you need to listen to what Jesus actually says, who came out of love, love of the Father, who, came, who has compassion upon you as one that does not know him and wants you to place your trust in him, to repent, to turn away from uh, your sins and to believe in him, to place your trust in him unto salvation. And if you're here this evening and you are a child of God, then sit at the feet of Jesus, have a merry Christmas and sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him and be reminded, it's not Christmas until I sit at the feet of Jesus. It's not Christmas until I truly submit myself to his will. It's not Christmas until I listen to him above everything else in the world and yield my life yet again completely, complete lordship uh, to him. I pray each and every person in here would have a merry Christmas. Let's pray together.